You're listening to the Azure DevOps Podcast, today featuring Lori Lampkin from Microsoft. The Azure DevOps Podcast is a show for developers and DevOps professionals shipping software using Microsoft technologies. Each show brings you hard-hitting interviews with industry experts, innovating better methods, and sharing success stories. Listen on to learn how to increase quality, ship quickly, and operate well. And now your host, Jeffrey Palermo. Welcome to another episode of the Azure DevOps Podcast. Go online to www.azuredevops.show to see show notes and other episodes. I'm really excited today to speak with today's guest, Lori Lampkin. Lori Lampkin has been the leading the Visual Studio Team Services program management since the birth of Team Foundation Server in 2002. As the director of program management, she led the transition of the team to agile methodologies, to open source reuse, to cloud services, to Azure, and to cloud services. Lori, welcome, welcome. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, I want to first apologize for my horrible husky voice. I uh, it's been pretty smoky here in Seattle uh, from the wildfires, and I guess it just affected me, and it's just uh, uh, affecting how I'm talking. So apologies for that. Oh yeah, but thank God you weren't affected uh, in a real sense. Some, I mean, it's <laughs> it's it's terrible. Those uh, those Ex- fires are raging. I know exactly. I bl- certainly I'll count my blessings that way. Definitely, definitely. Well, I've been so excited to uh, record this this interview with you because you have been a mover and a shaker for what is that? Sixteen years in the whole the whole space of shipping software better using Microsoft technologies, and and now we have Azure DevOps Services. Shoot, Azure Cloud. I mean, way back in two thousand and two when it first started, .dot <laughs> net was just getting started. Yeah. It's been a really exciting space to be in. Um, for people who know me, you know, the things that really uh, speak to me are I like to uh, collaborate, get people to collaborate together to get stuff done. And uh, it's been a wonderful journey because um, that's my passion. It's what I enjoy doing. It's what I get to do every day in my role as director of PM. And it's also what the product does. Like I get to build tools to help others get people to collaborate together and to deliver software. And um, it's been amazing. Uh, the industry has had tons of innovation. So it's been a, a big, a, a lot of learnings, a lot of uh, new things to um, come together and figure out how to best get things done. And that have really changed how people deliver software over the years. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's, it's, certainly, it's certainly been fantastic to see over all of this time um, so just, just a few weeks ago, there was that huge announcement of the restructuring of the entire VSTS product and breaking it up into different pieces and, and shifting it. And, and now it's uh, dev.azure.com and, and Azure DevOps Services. Um, that's, a, that's a huge fundamental change there. Um, would you mind sharing what was the just at the beginning the strategy that led to this to this big shift yeah sure you know it's it it feels like a big shift potentially you know um in terms of how we talk about the product or how you might acquire the product but our goal since the very beginning of TFS was that we integrate with the ecosystem of uh, the rest of what comes together for your application life cycle at that time is what we called it. And so we know that while it's great to provide an integrated suite of tools that works end to end, so you have what I call the easy button, you know, hey, just let me do it, you know, yeah. and uh, figure it out for me. Uh, we have that. Um, and that's been the primary way we've talked about the product. But we've always been able to allow you to mix and match our tools with different, you know, work item tracking systems like Jira or different CI CD systems and like Jenkins. And we've allowed people to do that, but people didn't know. 
Uh, and because we kept talking about it as a suite of TFS or VSTS, people would be like, they just assume you had to use all of it. So to me, um, our strategy has always been to embrace the heterogeneity that exists in the real world and to allow you to use pieces of our solution um, if, if you prefer to customize your own journey. Um, and, you know, just this is more of an effort to raise the awareness that that capability is there and also make it really a lot easier to just adopt a piece of VSTS and just use the CI CD system uh, with your with the your the rest of your stack that you use for DevOps. Yeah, that's all, that's awesome. Well, you've been you've been with the group through Visual Studio Team System and TFS <laughs> and then VSTS <laughs> and, and all that oh. and and now you you've left it in very capable hands. What's next for for you and what have you been up to? Yeah, so well, I um I feel like this is a great time for me to try to do something brand spanking new. I've been in developer tools since the beginning of my career when I came out of college and started working at Microsoft. So I've been exploring uh, lots of different opportunities at Microsoft. Uh, I feel like I have uh, many choices, but at my level, they have to do a lot of um, org shuffling to figure out how I fit in. And that's just not something that happens in a matter of weeks. So I'm trying to be patient which isn't um, my best trait. <laughs> so it's exercising that. And in the meantime, I'm directing a ton of energy to cool, fun stuff uh, at home uh, this summer. And I've been uh, joking with my husband that, you know, we have a list, long list of stuff we've wanted to get done around the house. And, um, and I look at it and go, that uh, backlog has got some excellent velocity uh, this summer <laughs> so far due to my additional time spent. Uh, I can still complain quite a bit about the cycle time since the ideas have been on that backlog for a very long time. Uh, but yes, it's been very uh, rewarding to, to kind of power through that. Um, although it can be a little hard on the pocketbook sometimes. Oh yeah. <laughs> now is the backlog <laughs> shrinking because you're knocking them out or is it growing because you have time to think of new ideas? I know, I know. It's like, Oh, I clean the storage room and then it's like, okay, Maybe I should go through that box and throw some other stuff away. You know, like it is a little bit uh, more things pop up, but it, it feels great um, to, to finally get some of this stuff done. Awesome. And also spend a lot more time with my kids who I have twin boys. They just turned 16 oh, wow. uh, a month ago. So I was able to help make sure they got their driver's licenses and, uh -oh. um, you know, do some things with them this summer. They're on the tennis team. So I'm being the team mom and, you know, some stuff fun things that I haven't had the chance to do uh, before, but uh, soon enough, it's going to be time to get back to the real world of uh, building great software customers love. Oh, that sounds fun. It sounds like a great summer. Yeah. Well, there's a, you know, if you, if you look at, at some statistics, there's a huge influx of software developers into the industry. And of course, businesses all over can't find enough programmers of all types. And so we have this huge influx of early twenties among the, the developer community. And then they probably don't even know the journey that Microsoft and, and the whole industry has gone through with an understanding of how to take source, uh, uh, source code, organize it properly, use it properly. And then what it means to make a build to do some quality control, like automated testing or other things, and and then automated deployments is uh, people are still adopting that. So, um, what would you say to the to the younger folks, uh, just as far as what the what the history has been before Azure DevOps Services for context? Yeah, well, um, I it's probably a blessing <laughs> not to have gone through some of that because I think in at the beginning when we did waterfall. Uh, style development, um, it wasn't very connected with customers. You know, you would start out with great customer connection if you um, were so inclined, which uh, luckily at Team Foundation Server, we really were. Um, but then we kind of went into a little hole and built the software and then had this grand reveal of what we called betas. And, um, and then people had to install, download and install and 
And then, you know, that was a, its own process and, uh, and deploy it through their organization, get the team to use it. So it took a long time for people to start being able to give us feedback on, on the product. And by the time we got feedback, we were getting ready to wrap it up and call it a release and, and sell it to the world. And so what I, what I would hear is people give me feedback. I'd be like, wow, that's a great idea. We'd love to do that. We'll do that in two years in our next product cycle. Yeah. And, uh, oh, that's um, really hard. It's hard on the customers, um, although it was the norm in the day. Um, but it was also hard on the team uh, to feel like, you know, every day I'm doing something that matters. You know, every day I'm making an impact on customers' lives because it's really every day I'm make, making an impact on customers' lives years from now. Uh, and, uh, now with, you know, being able to just use cloud services and use it real time for us to be able to deploy continuously, uh, we can just be that much more in touch with our customers and it makes our customers happier and our jobs so much more satisfying. So it's such a great, um, place and time to be in the software industry, uh, when you can uh, feel like every day I'm, I'm having an impact. Yeah, that's that's so true. Um, it, before it was it was hard technically just to just to the mechanics of putting out a release, and so you didn't do it. Shoot, you didn't even do it every week, or some people did it every six months or whatnot. And now the mechanics have become so easy. You you can do it every day if you want to. Yeah, I mean, I think when I think about that um, transformation, I feel like the first big pivot was moving from that waterfall mindset to agile, you know, where it was like, Hey, you know, we don't have to deliver everything all at once. What if we just improved one thing at a time and delivered in chunks uh, and chunks that made sense together. And it took a little bit of a different twist in, in how you plan. And boy, when we first started doing that, it was really hard because people were used to planning in six month increments. And then to be able to say three weeks, it was like mind spinning, you know, was, I can't figure out what I'm, you know, how do I break down this huge idea to just what I'm going to do in the next three weeks. And so it took a little bit of practice. Um, but once we were able to do that, um, that really changed the world because the, the schedule that you have is like the heartbeat of your organization. It's like everything moves along on that sort of cadence. And when you change that, a bunch of other systems have to change too. You know, it's like, oh, how do I report progress? And how do I, how yeah. often do I talk to customers? And how often do I deploy? And all these things start coming along with as soon as you change the schedule. Um, so I think I look at that as kind of the first big key to making a transformation is how often uh, are you doing your planning increments? Um, yeah. And so that was, I think, key to the early part of our journey. And then we felt like we needed to do it because, of course, we're building DevOps tools. So we need to adopt the DevOps practices first so that we can learn all the ugliness and kind of flesh it out and then, uh, you know, be able to speak from authority and be able to build tools that help guide people down the right path. Um, yeah. The second, yeah, the second big change is a little more challenging, you know, and I think that one uh, is equally pivotal um, because in order to actually get your organization to fully embrace automating your deployments and fully embrace, you know, delivering at such a rapid pace. Uh, you can't have organizations accountable for little pieces of the life cycle. So we merged our development and test disciplines into one uh, engineering discipline. And we also brought in operations of our service uh, into the engineering team and made engineering accountable for that full end-to-end -end delivery. And I tell you, um, it, when it's nobody else's problem but your own, all of a sudden, the world changes. There's no throwing code over the wall to QA and sitting there and waiting, QA being three months behind, and then they submit a bug, and it's something you wrote code on four months ago. And, mm -hmm. Oh, you have to context set, reset and you know, it's like, oh, you know, I don't even remember what I wrote then. And so it just slows down the whole process. It's like, no, I, 
you can't really blame another team for, you know, slowing you down. It's like, hey, we better get faster ourselves. And so there's a lot more investment into the tools and processes of how we get things done because it's completely under our control. Um, and that's been able to allow us to deliver software a lot more frequently because um, it's not like you don't feel disempowered waiting for another team to figure themselves out. Yeah, you know, that transformation that you've been through, that's such a good example for other folks because uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of other companies that are not the size of Microsoft or have the investment into software to do projects on the scale that that Microsoft does. Um, and, and one of the one of the questions I think a lot of people have is, what are the roles I need in my organization, and what are the ratios, and how how many of each? You guys, you guys had testing completely separate, and then you had deployment and operations completely separate. And now you're, and now the the team is all together. What what are the current job descriptions that you've decided to go with? Yeah, it's a software development engineer <laughs> is what it is. I mean. There's the program management team, which I run, you know, and uh, the program management is really responsible for the strategy of the product, the backlog. They're kind of like the product owner in Scrum. But in addition to that, they're responsible for the design of the actual customer experience. Um, The dev team is responsible for everything else. You know, how is what, you know, is is the service up and running? Um, Are there live site issues? Uh, the quality of the code being written, the architecture, the deployments, all of it. And that's really different from, okay, I write the code and architecture as a dev and as Mm -hmm. a tester, I'm responsible for the quality. But I get a bunch of stuff thrown over to me that isn't very good to begin with. And now what do I do? I just have to throw it back. Uh, When one person's responsible for both of that, you can see how suddenly it's like, wow, you know, this is really different. Um, And then to go and say, hey, if I deploy to production and something's wrong, I'm the one who gets called at two o'clock in the morning, gets woken up, has to get up and online and fix it. And so that accountability changes everything because all of a sudden, next time I'm going to write better tests (laughs) that catch these issues because I don't want to wake up at two in the morning. And um, next time I'm going to say, you know what, that deployment might not be ready and hold it for an extra day or something because it's my accountability. And, um, and that made that whole investment into better tests, faster tests, being able to run them more frequently, being able to automate the deployment, being able to detect issues early, mitigate issues quickly. All of that came from that, you know, hey, I don't want anything to go wrong because if it does... I'm going to have to do the reactive work. So way more fun to do the proactive work. And with that, let's take a break for a word from our sponsor. The Azure DevOps Podcast is sponsored by ClearMeasure, a software engineering firm and Microsoft Gold Partner, empowering development teams to be their best. ClearMeasure equips developers with the DevOps tools, methods, and automation necessary to focus on building their applications rather than wrestling with builds, deployments, or environments. Click clear-measure.com to see whether a DevOps implementation is for you. So that's a big shift from the way that you guys and a lot of IT organizations are structured where you have developers and then you have testers writing tests or doing manual tests. So so ha- the organization you decided to go with has the same people, the same type of developer writing the code and doing the testing. Is that right? That's right. That's right. And, you know, you also have to remember that with the cloud service, testing can be really different because we can deploy to just a few people. You know, I can deploy. Um, we have something called feature flags, which is essentially exposure control so that I can deploy into production and only be able to see it myself or only my team can see it, or then I can turn it on for a few customers. And so it's like you end up doing a lot of testing in production uh, and being able to control the risk through that sort of um, exposure control that we have. Uh, And that makes, it puts a lot less pressure on testing in terms of I've got to find everything before the deployment goes through it's only going through to a couple people, it's okay, especially if they're people who want to help test. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and sometimes what happens in production can only be interpreted by somebody who has intimate knowledge of how the software is put together. That's right. I think, you know, what happens in production, you know, like it, nothing is exactly the same in a test environment as it is in production. And so, mm -hmm. um, and that makes it a lot easier for us to be able to put things out into production in a very controlled manner, not affect our general customer experience, uh, and be able to use real live production data, real live production configurations, network bandwidth, you know, kind of all of that is right there for us. So we can, we can be able to um, not try to spend all this time emulating something. It, it's a heck of a lot faster just to, to try it. Right. Out. Yeah. And you, so the whole industry is is adopting cloud and adopting DevOps methods and practices. But you also took took your group through the waterfall to agile transition. Of course, the whole industry has gone through that as well. Um, a lot of people say that the the waterfall to agile shift the the biggest thing was doing work in smaller chunks or doing release in smaller chunks and doing more of them. What what would you say is the is the biggest shift when it comes to uh, moving, progressing from from agile and adopting DevOps? Yeah, well, so that's to me. Um, you're right about the agile transition. It's like smaller chunks, and that's what I call the schedule. You know, it's like if your schedule of planning does things in smaller chunks, then all of a sudden everything else starts to flow from it, uh, and the shift to DevOps. Uh, is really about accountability. You know, who's accountable for the code that's in production? If it's your ops team, then your dev team is going to be light years ahead coding something else, you know, and they're not going to be in touch with the customers and what's happening in production because they're not accountable and they're not called in the middle of the night and they're not, their son's birthday party is not interrupted. And so, you know, they're perfectly moving on ahead and feeling like those slow people in production uh, and, um, you know, doing production operations. So, so to me, it becomes accountability. And I recognize everybody can't go and reorganize their team and take on all this additional accountability. Um, but you can think differently as an engineer. You can say, I am responsible for this end-to-end -end and what I'm going to be giving uh, you know, into deployment and um, is going to be of the highest quality that I can have. And you can take steps in that direction. But I talk to... CTOs and CIOs and CEOs all the time about this journey and they are moving towards centralizing that accountability into one discipline because of all the benefits that you get from, you know, smoother, you know, you're not transitioning between lots of different people to get things done. And because, you know, it's really hard for ops teams to keep up with all the deployments and also invest in tooling to help the diagnose, you know, diagnose and be proactive. And they have huge, like I talked about my personal home backlog. Mm -hmm. I think in ops, they have, you know, things they've thought of that would help make their jobs easier that are much, you know, been on that backlog much longer, you know, and they just don't get the time because the pace of delivery is so fast. Yeah. Um, and if, if you realize that you can deliver even faster, uh, if you make those investments, um, all of a sudden things can really change and, and, and the morale of the team can change as well. So you have, everyone's a software development engineer. Yeah. And you used to have people who had an entire career that was software testing. Yes. And, and now you don't. Is that right? That's right. Um, we, uh, you know, there might be pockets, you know, Microsoft is a huge company, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so yeah. we have some 80,000 engineers at Microsoft and there might be some pockets of people who call each other testers. I couldn't say what Xbox does in, in detail there as an example, but predominantly we've eliminated the test discipline from Microsoft. And that transition was very challenging um, because some, what had happened at Microsoft was everybody wanted to kind of be a developer. And so it became a little bit of a second class discipline, you know, Oh, well that person might not be ready to be a developer. Yeah. Let's start them as a tester. And, and it's like, then they don't get the rigor and the training of, you know, kind of um, writing code that's ready for production and they're writing code that's for testing and, you know, people aren't doing the rigorous code reviews and all that of that. So, um, so uh, 
you know, some people made the transition very easily and others really struggled with the transition, especially people focused primarily on manual testing. And um, so it was a painful transition, but um, one that we felt like was going to help the company deliver better, faster quality software to our customers. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I I think we've realized that. Yeah. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but but there's probably historically been a lot of people who had the career track of systems engineer or broadly called IT pro. Uh, Did y'all have those or or how does that fit in or, or does it? Um, well, no. I, so, um, if I go way back in time, what we would do is we deliver box software. So we would say, Oh, here, let's put this TFS thing together. And, and then you buy it and you run it. And it's okay. your deal. Yeah. You have the it pros to go do that. Like we don't even have those people except in Microsoft it, you know, we have MS it is what we call it. And, and of course they build all the apps that we use to, you know, do performance reviews or expense reports. And at one point in time, they ran TFS for the company and, um, and they had it pro, you know, um, persona. Uh, I don't think they called them that. I think they still called them software development engineers. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they, um, they had that same kind of, uh, operations, um, uh, yeah, operating the service for the company. And as a part of that big accountability change I was talking about is, instead of them being kind of like this distant group far off away running software for the company, we brought them in. So they're part of our engineering organization. Now we still have people that specialize in monitoring, um, you know, writing the health monitors and, um, and you know, mitigating issues and doing um, all that sort of tier one uh, issue resolution that happens. And, and there is a set of people, but they are still part of the engineering team so that we try to prioritize uh, work that helps them be more efficient in our overall backlog that the entire engineering team does um, as a whole versus kind of seeing it as some side team way off over in the corner somewhere that we care less about um, their experience. Okay. Yeah. So your whole system runs in your Azure data center. So, so you, you leave it completely up to the, the, the systems engineers and the, the network administrators that actually work in the Azure data center to, to operate everything. And the, the developers are required to have a skill set that's broad enough to operate the components of Azure that the software is running on. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, of course, you know, we build our software on Azure. And so if there are issues deeper inside of Azure, SQL Azure or networking or whatever, we need to be able to narrow down the problem. But but then we get on, you know, when there's an issue in production, we create a a bridge and um, and we can pull in people uh, from our dependent components onto that bridge to help us diagnose the issue. Okay, this looks like we're having a networking issue or this looks like it's you know, an upgrade is happening in a certain data center. This is a localized problem, um, you know, and, and they can help us. Uh, so there's a, there's a, it's not like we're isolated to ourselves. It's mm-hmm. the whole company trying to come together to make the customer experience great for all of the services that are running on top of Azure. And if there are issues, we're all jumping in to help. Lots of times there are vice presidents on those bridges, um, you know, as well, trying to make sure that, we're clearing out, you know, any issues as quickly as possible and getting all the experts on the phone to mitigate things as quickly as possible for the best customer experience on Azure. Yeah. yeah at some point, I think there's going to be a historian who's going to analyze the last few decades and put that into the history of computer science. I think a lot of people in the computer science curriculum um, learn about the the mainframes of yesteryear and all those other things. But now we have some era where the whole industry had decided to separate into groups. And now the industry, I think with Microsoft and other companies leading has decided, no, we're just going to have one group. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it's really, really different. Um, And I think there's also um, much more, you know, the business is much more competitive (laughs) Uh, people, customers expect a heck of a lot more. They expect 
value being delivered faster. And I think it makes the leaders in the organization talk to customers a lot more, be much more in tune and do things like, I remember having bugs that would get ping ponged back and forth between, oh, is this a bug in Windows? No, it's a bug over here. You know, and like different teams would do that. And it's like three months later, the bug still isn't fixed. You know, now you're talking about VPs getting on a live site bridge and fixing this sort of thing in a matter of minutes. You know, like there's a that time to delivery and the customer expectation has made, you know, everyone sit up and take notice and and role model how important customers are and how important their experience is. And we prioritize that above, you know, new feature development. It's like what's the experience today is way more important than what we're going to be delivering tomorrow. Yeah. When we were mentioning that, I, re- I remember reading a story from the, the mid 90s book called Microsoft Secrets of doing Microsoft Office in what was it, 1994, 1995. And uh, <laughs> some of that, <laughs> some of that was in some of those stories. It's very old school. It's been very refreshing to see. And it just feels like you can get so much done, much less log jams and red tape. It's like, you know, yeah. everyone's kind of trying to get through the issues. There's a, and frankly, our, you know, DevOps tooling has helped with that a lot because, you know, there's transparency across, across organizations where you can see what people are working on. It's easier to hand off issues. So Satya has a, has a culture change that he's driving. And then there's also an initiative bet- behind uh, something called One ES. Can you tell us yeah. about that? Yeah. So, you know, I think this has been kind of Satya's stamp that he's put on Microsoft has been, you know, the growth mindset and, you know, clarity and leadership. And he's really trying to um, kind of modernize Microsoft, be open and, um, and uh, you know, work great with, you know, the whole industry and partnership and a lot, you know, embrace open source and a whole bunch of different things he's done to really uh, modernize Microsoft as a company. Uh, and as a part of that, he, you know, he's observed, uh, we have, a, you know, hundreds of thousands of people working here and uh, every organizational leader can create their own own team and their own subculture. And, um, and it's really hard then to work across teams uh, when we use different tools and different processes and have different values. Uh, so it's part of this whole culture change. He's invested heavily in what we call the one ES or the one engineering system at Microsoft. So a standard set of tools, practices, and cultural values that we can rely on to help us go through our own DevOps transformation as a company um, to deliver value to customers more frequently. Uh, And the backbone of the 1ES is Azure DevOps or Visual Studio Team System, whatever you want to call it these days. Um, And uh, that backbone, you know, people have been adopting that. You know, of course, we're talking about a bunch of divergent backgrounds and people who've been shipping software for 30 years plus and old code bases and build systems and scripts that people are afraid to touch or, you know, spaghetti code and, you know, kind of all of that. So, and then a brand new spanking new web services and cloud services that are, you know, lightweight and containerized and, you know, all that. So we have the full spectrum of um, types of apps and services that we build in state of code base. And so um, adopting to Azure DevOps has been, a journey that's different for every team at Microsoft. And uh, the approach has been, okay, what's most painful to you? And what are you seeing that you need to fix? And okay, well, that sounds like it's your build system. So let's get you on a great CI CD pipeline. Or, oh, you know, the first thing that we started on about five years ago was really about planning and the agile transformation across the company. So at this point, really the whole team is using um, the Azure DevOps um, Agile tooling, um, but uh, and th- and then the next thing was Git as a version control system. Yeah, uh, we had uh, some proprietary internal systems. We had some use of um, our centralized version control system TFBC, uh, but no real standardization, and that makes it hard to share code and components across the company, uh, and let alone learn from each other. And the industry's moved to distributed version control, and Git's where it's at, and. Kids come out of college and they know Git and, 
and now they have to learn something new and different. Well, that's just silly. Like, so we, um, we've adopted Git pretty much across the company. And there's some great stories online at aka.ms back DevOps mm-hmm. that are about even the Windows team's journey. You can imagine terabytes of source code uh, being stored in Git, and they're the world's largest um, Git repo out Amazing. there. And they're able to use Git at scale um, for an organization and a code base that large. So uh, we've had some great innovations to try to make sure um, DevOps can come to the small weight, lightweight, modern apps and services, as well as even the largest, most enterprise ready code bases we've got. That's amazing how, how large the Windows code base is. And now it's the, the largest Git repository in the world. Wouldn't that say that there's no other piece of software in the world that then you could say, oh, Git can't handle this? Well, that's uh, that's what we think. We'll find out, you know, we'll see as more and more people start using our um, our Git solution within Azure DevOps, I think, you know, we're ready to, to take issues. So send them our way and tell us if you run into anything. But um, we're continuing to work on scale improvements because, you know, performance is a never ending process. It can never be fast enough for engineers. So oh, yeah. uh, we work very closely with the Windows team to understand where they uh, see things are slow from the from their own engineers' experience, and, and we're constantly rolling out scale improvements. Awesome. Well, as we wrap up, how can our listeners get going with taking advantage of what DevOps thinking can do for them? Yeah, well, so I mentioned it briefly, but there's a site, aka.ms, back DevOps. And from there, you can really, you can see um, our journey. There's many videos and articles that we've done on uh, our transformation to Agile and to DevOps um, and other teams at Microsoft, as well as case studies from other companies to learn from, as well as you can learn about to Azure DevOps itself, the product and um, and what we have to offer there to help give you that easy button, as I was talking about, if you just want uh, to get started and have it all fit together for you based on proven best practices, that's the best way to go. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Lori, for visiting with me. Great. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. And until next week, keep shipping. You've been listening to the Azure DevOps Podcast, a show for developers and DevOps professionals shipping software using Microsoft technologies. Go to www.azuredevops.show for show notes and other episodes. On behalf of your host, Jeffrey Palermo, and our sponsors, thanks for listening, and may God bless you.